everyone. So today we have a really, really special guest. It took a while in the making, but it finally happened. And um, no introduction that I give is going to do justification for who he is. So we're gonna just let him talk for himself. But either way, his name is Sanjay. He is the other half of the Bloom Mafia. You know, if you've not had a, heard of Bloom, the most phenomenal, phenomenal VC fund out there, not just in India, but I would call them one of the better funds in the world. Um, and we are very excited, and I am super excited to have Sanjay here together with us for him to share his journey, his story, and all his experiences that he's been through so far in his tremendous, exciting career. So Sanjay, thank you so much. Really, thank you for joining us today. Yes, it's great to be on. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, there's so much to talk about, you know, and so much that has happened since I've spoken to your partner, Kartik. You know, we've had you guys you announced your, your fund. Metal got acquired. Yes. Um, so many things happened, you know, and we'll eventually we'll get into that. You know, and so I'm assuming there's so many things upon your mind right now. But let's just take a step back and go all the way from the beginning to when you were, you were a child. You know, so where are you from? And then, you know, and what your upbringing was like and all. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, like Karthik, I travel a lot. Uh, some, you know, I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I don't know which city I am. But tonight, I'm actually in my home city. I'm a Bombay boy. Uh, you know, now it's called Mumbai, but uh, people from Bombay always call it Bombay. Uh, this is home. Uh, uh, grew up here. So, uh, uh, you know, went to high school here. Um, and then went to uh, did a, a, a studied engineering at a college called Bits Pilani, uh, you know, which is where uh, the founders of Ray Orange also from the juniors of mine from uh, from undergrad. And this was actually you know quite a very tech heavy uh, college. Uh, we were actually started a collaboration with MIT. So uh, till, uh, I, I never saw this, but the stories I've heard is till the 1960s and 70s actually had professors from MIT come across and they had this sort of exchange program. So very strong engineering groups. Uh, in fact, next week I'm actually back at campus uh, visiting for the first time after graduating. We're going to do like a you know tech ecosystem event. So pretty excited about that. Um, my uh, upbringing, uh, just very briefly, uh, it's interesting. It'll come out later. My father is a role model. You know, he's a uh, he's actually an investor, supporter, and advisor to Bloom. Very close to Karthik also, besides me. And he was a lawyer for 20 years, uh, and then. Uh, you know, got tired of law and then with two Americans uh, started a software company that did fairly well, it took a long time. He started at the age of 42. Uh, it's a very, very interesting story. Maybe you can cover him some other time. But basically, set up, they set up the company between Chicago and Pune, which is outside India. It was like a, you know, like a Wipro Infosys for financial services. And they uh, finally did an IPO on the NASDAQ, uh, you know, in the early 2000s. So, He's been very entrepreneurial. He's, you know, he's a sort of informal mentor advisor to Bloom, and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, and and I'm bringing. I went to a business school. I went to UCLA, and then I spent about 15 years in California before moving back to India. Wow. Now the question was going to be like, you now where do you have entrepreneurship in your in, in DNA? And you, you mentioned your father. You know, um, you had your father, and the, fa the fact that your father started a company of 42 is just a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. And that's like a message in general to saying to never give up hope. It's never too late to do anything, never too late at all, and just do and start and, and all that. You know, 42 is a new is a new 20. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. So you go, to, you moved to US. You went to UCLA. You said, um, you know, so what was it? What did you do in, in the U.S. at that period of time? Those 15 years until you actually moved back until and to India. Sure, you know it's interesting. Um, this was uh, you know Karthik went to business school just about the same time. Right? He went to the East Coast of Washington. We didn't know each other in the U.S. Mm. It's such a big country, so many Indians, but ironically, you all meet you know in India itself, right? In, in the city, because it's so big. But uh, you know, when I went to business school, uh, this was just around just before the time of the dot com, uh, the boom and the bust. Um, and, uh, you know, as you know, like a lot of immigrants at that time, um, you kind of, you know, you, you want to become a permanent resident, you want to, you know, apply for a green card, and then you have this sort of quote unquote American dream. And at that time, there was, there was this onset of e-business, right? If you look at the, around the 2000, you had lots of these very interesting uh, cutting edge uh, consulting firms, uh, Science, Wyant, Sapien, Mitchell Madison, many of them breakouts from McKinsey and Maine. 
And at that time, uh, they were really hot. Uh, San Francisco was the most difficult office to get into. Uh, you know, I did fairly well at business school, so I, I got a couple of good offers. And people said, you're crazy, you know, why are you going to a PwC, such an old kind of bricks and mortar thing, you know, you've got to move with the times. I mean, you live in California. And I, I, I joined the strategy consulting practice, the high-tech practice for PwC, joined them in San Francisco. Uh, and then, you know, in two, three years, many of these firms went down under, right? Just with the dot-com uh, bust. Uh, but it was very interesting because through PwC, we actually did consult with some of these, both the giants of Intel, Intel, Sun Microsystems, but also some of these dot-com. So it was a very interesting uh, experience without, you know, the flame outs and without the risk of seeing this from the outside. And then I spent time at Sun Microsystems, which is now the Facebook campus in Menlo Park, and basically PwC strategy consulting, and then IBM got it. Um, and then I set up a, a legal outsourcing company, which did okay, did all right. It was, you know, it just, barely, just returned capital, like whatever went in. Um, uh, the idea was to replicate Canby's success. Canby was a company that my father and his co-founders had started. And the idea was, whatever happened, if you could replicate the success of India's competence in BPO mm -hmm. to KPO, right, which is knowledge process outsourcing. Uh, interestingly, that's the time when I became a member of the Mumbai Angels and, uh, you know, started making small investments, right? I mean, we, are, we, are, we weren't like, you know, rich angels, really, really small, whatever we save from our paycheck, really on the side, $5,000, 10000 One of them was a company called Inmobi, uh, in which I'm still a small investor and still I'm close to and uh, uh, you know, that was, I would say, one of the uh, sort of impetus or the, the pushes, right, that, uh, that pushed me to come to India. And uh, that was about, this we're talking about like 2008 to 2010 when I started contemplating, uh, you know, move back to India. Right. Wow. So then, so you already started your family and everything else in America already? That's right. That's right. Wow. Yes. So, you, so when you moved back to India in 2008, 2010, when did you move back to India? Uh, 2010. Yes. You had to pick up and move. So how was that the transition for your family? You know, you, you're right. You've got to, that's, that's the most difficult person to convince. I know you've already had this uh, chat with Karthik. I think in my case, what is a little easier is that my wife is also from Bombay. Mm -hmm. uh, our son was born in the US. In fact, the reason this interview got late is that, you know, I went to UCLA and UCLA has now come to talk to high schoolers. He's 15 now. Right. So uh, I was on the listing side, right? They were just talking. So he was seven and a half when we moved seven. So he was a little older. My wife's also from Bombay. It made the personal transition easier. My brother, who was an I banker, had also moved back. And you know, we you, you started seeing a lot of stories. You can't take move back in two thousand six. I think as the years sort of went further, you saw more and more role models and examples, right. case, case studies, if you will. And so you had more uh, stories to exchange. Uh, it's it's never easy, right? It's never easy. I think the right thing is to have the right expectations. Uh, every place is unique and has its advantages. And then we were quite clear, very very clear about what we were moving back for. And uh, I was actually ready for. It's very interesting, you know, new new country, new life, new uh, career. Uh, everything was new. Right. Wow. So you move back, you know, 2010. Obviously, you move back because you wanted to get involved in the startup world and everything like that, angel investing. Um, and you have yet to meet Kartik, which you eventually yeah. met, met through the Mumbai Angels. Um, so we know Kartik's part of the story of how he got into Bloom and founded Bloom. I want to hear your part, of it, your version. You know, yeah, sure. how you met Kartik and you know how the idea of Bloom came about. Sure. You know, I think uh, in just a minute, just a, you know, a couple of seconds on Kartik's case. I think it was really interesting. In his case, it already made the uh, you know move back to India, so he was very well entrenched in India in that sense working at the Times Group, leading the private equity division. In my case, I was, uh, I had a very open mind and, uh, you know, I'm just sharing this. So, you know, for a year, we actually didn't, uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't rent our place out. We just kept it empty in San Francisco, right? And said, let's check it out, right? So you take, you're, you're not taking a one-way ticket, but you're kind of, uh, you know, just, just exploring things. But we just realized that you can't dip your toes in the water, you have to dive in. Very interestingly, uh, both of us had similar plans with a different set of people. He had been approaching this much more seriously because he was already in India. And in that sense, he had already led it. But the group of people that he was doing with uh, this with uh, sort of didn't, didn't take off or, you know, there was nobody else who also jumped in so early. I was going to do this with a different group. 
and uh, uh, one of the folks was from Canada, and that didn't materialize. And then somebody in the Mumbai Angels um, uh, very helpfully suggested that he, he said, "You know, you're looking to come back. You've got a similar idea. You have to go talk to this guy, Karthik Reddy. He has a similar idea." And uh, it's interesting. I don't know if Karthik is in touch with this guy. I'm also not in touch. And my father, Mr. Nath, always asks me. He says, "You guys have to talk to this guy sometime. He's the, you know, he's the matchmaker. He's the guy who introduced you." So my story, I would say, was more of an angel turned VC. You know, I didn't have a formal VC background. I was more a management consultant slash operational entrepreneur slash angel who became a VC. I didn't have formal private equity background, and which is what I really love. Right? I love the. We would get into that later, I'm sure. But uh, I love the people aspect. I like the early stage, the angel, the quote unquote angel slash early stage part of venture. And, and, and just to finish the story, since this is a nice personal talk, uh, very interestingly, when we went back, when Karthik and I went back in 2010, 11, uh, on an exploratory trip, um, we actually stayed in my almost furniture list apartment in Eclero Hill in San Francisco. And it was good, you know, we saved some rent. Uh, interestingly, one of the first ideas we were approached by was to, by Techstars to bring Techstars to India. You know, that was seriously on the table. And we thought about it, and we just thought that you know, I think we'd rather go and build our own brand, right? We have our own vision and own passion and let's go and build something on our own. Texas is a great brand and it's great to represent them, but we, we, we decided that we want to do something of our own. Right. Wow. So this guy, whoever he is, you know, should definitely be calling you guys up, say, hey, hey, Sanjay, hey, Kartik, you know, I want my commission over here. I introduce you guys, you know? So that's phenomenal. That's an incredible story. So you, you go about, you know, so you obviously you go about and you, you launch Bloom, you decide to start Bloom. Um, you know, from your perspective, you know, what were you, the, some of the, the early struggles and, and that you had to overcome? You know, you're two new kids on the block, you know, why would someone trust you with their money? And, you know, we're not talking about like, you know, a startup here, you're talking about you, you needed a nice amount of money in order to invest in the other startups to make ideas happen. So what were the, all those things that you went through then? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think if you think about, look at the word first, right, you have the first time fund. You have first-time fund managers. Right. You have a team that actually has not worked together ever. Mm -hmm. That has met about, I mean, met about two years before they've started. So you have a lot of checkbox. You have a lot of checkboxes against you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the struggles were uh, you seem like a you know smart uh, bunch of founders. Um, you know, you've got some uh, angel investments under your belt, but they're still very very early, and they're also part of a large angel group. And uh, you know that you have the belief and the passion between, but you don't have the track record, which is why the first time fund is so difficult. Uh, and I think some of the struggles were just time, right? I mean, Karthi has written a blog about this. Uh, you know, we we probably had 600 meetings. Uh, we probably had six meetings to get, uh, you know, let's say 100,000 from a person. And you're buying that person a coffee in a four seasons, <laughs> you know, five, six, uh, you know, five, six times. Uh, I think there's no other way around it. Today, we have so many of Karthik's and my friends coming to us and saying, hey, tell us how you did it. And there's just no way around it. It's just, and that's the beauty of doing something for the first time, right? There is no shortcut. So I think, I, I think the struggles were just, uh, uh, I think you've got, we, we just found people who believe in us. Um, and that sounds a little cliche, but I think that's the only way. And, uh, and uh, you really remember that, right? You really remember the people who supported you. Um, uh, for the first time and, and it's fantastic when they I'll tell you something on Twitter there's a person and you know we're expanding in Bangalore right I'm in Bangalore I'm in Japan this week I'm in Bangalore tomorrow for three days and uh, uh, he said can I apply this guy's a successful agent investor he says I don't need a JD uh, I know you know me I would love to come and work for you you know and, and this guy supported us uh, very very early so it's fantastic to see that sort of come around right wow hey, I want to apply too can I apply <laughs> yeah, we, we, we need to be in New York, absolutely. Sure. So that, that, that's just a phenomenal, phenomenal journey um, that, that you had, obviously, from the beginning. You know, and being, the, you know, I guess the, one of the first, you know, first-time founder, um, you know, first-time founder for a VC fund, first time, you know, raising money, everything like that. All those first, they give you also the same benefit that you came without any biases or any a notion of how things should work. And, um, you know, you're going to figure out everything for the first time. And the fact these investors gave you the money is um, just, it shows the, the trust that they, they had in you guys, you know, and they believed in you sure. and all that. It's incredible. Um, you know, so let me we'll jump ahead for a little bit right now, you know, we, we, on that topic over here. 
you just raised your third fund. Um, Actually, first, first close of the third fund, yeah. First close of it, right, correct. First close of the third fund. Now, what are the lessons you learned in between funds? You know, but first I want to understand, what are your emotions like? You know, now you see that you, 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 you closed it, the first part of your third fund. How does that make you feel? You know, that something's working here. No, you know, it's an interesting question. I think it's always half glasses, half empty, half full, right? You feel really uh, happy about the accomplishments. But then you think about, you know, the, the path ahead, right? It's never over till it's over. And, you know, when you're ambitious and you want to really build a large platform, you always want, you're always thinking about, you know, one, one eye in the rearview mirror and, you know, one eye looking forward. So I think, uh, I, uh, I think the emotions, I think the biggest emotions are that Bloom is, uh, while it's led by the founders in the sense, you know, by, by the vision and the, the passion, I think the fact that Bloom has become a living, breathing uh, uh, entity is the biggest uh, emotion that you feel, right? It's, it's beyond people, it's beyond one or two people. Uh, today, that investment team is, uh, you know, eight and counting. Uh, Karthik may have talked about Constellation, the platform. You know, very early, we've been looking at Andreessen Horowitz and First Round Capital. That is, a, that is a platform of 40 people. So when you ask about emotions, the fact that uh, this has grown to, you know, 10 plus 40, if you look at both these entities, is really, really interesting, right? Really, very, very fulfilling. Um, if, you ask, if you ask about the learnings along the way, um, you know, uh, I mean that's an interesting question. We can't claim to have all uh, can't claim to have all the answers, but uh, uh, I think one thing I I would say is uh, you you know I've, I've we've heard this before from Valley VCs who say that the best thing after uh, the best thing after a yes is a fast no, and uh, Kant is really good at that, right? I try and get better and better at that because I'm more diplomatic. Um, I think we've just realized also for us who, to, who we should spend time with. Just like, you know, where founders have to spend, decide which species, species they pitch to and who should, they shouldn't. I think for us also, we've got to decide, you know, where, where our supporters want to come from, who likes our story, who may like a story, but would just never do glow, right? I think that's one of the biggest learnings. Where do you spend time with and where you don't? Uh, at the end, everything comes back to time. So I think that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest learnings. And the other, the other is, what I think in whatever we do, just like, you know, we're looking to back a startup, uh, everybody's got to find out what, what their sweet spot is and be the best at that. Right? So in our case, if you look at it, you know, we started as a micro VC. That was, I would say, quote, quote unquote, like a learning fund. And, uh, you know, the second fund, we became a little more like seed and angel and 3A. Now this fund is going to be 3A slash A. But our sweet spot is always to come in early. I think, uh, uh, you know, even if, we, if it was great and we got this massive amount of capital, then what, you know, we tomorrow went and raised like four, $500 million, uh, we would still always like to start early because I think that's our DNA. So I think one, of, I think the learning, just to sort of sum up, I think one of the things is to you know, decide where you spend, focus your time and energy on, we've seen along the way. And the second is uh, uh, really figure out what that sweet spot is and get better and better at that and just be the best at that, right? Not not, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word greedy, but say, okay, you know, I've got $400 million now, let me go and become a classic growth stage fund just because that's the easiest thing to do. Wow, that's an incredible lesson. Now, so let's change your perspective and look from, you know, the VC eyes towards like a startup and founders, you know? So the first thing is like, what are the common denominators you see between successful founders um, and have built, they have the ability or built a, a, a beautiful company? Right. By the way, I just happened to be having this mug, which is actually by Factor Daily, which is one of our portfolio companies. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why, why I picked this up, but they have, they just, this is, I don't know if that's me. If it can be seen, that's supposed yeah. to be me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. you know, one of the things that you just said, uh, for a second, you said that, um, you know, a car ticket is easier saying no, you know, time-wise. It's very special. You know, Indians are just such nice people. I can't understand. I don't think they can say no. They, have the, they don't have the ability to say no. They're just incredible people, nice people. You know, it's interesting. Actually, what you said is very interesting. I think it's a dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. um, most people, uh, uh, most Indians, and I think most Asians, Asians, right? Think about Thai, think about Thai hospitality, mm -hmm. Vietnamese. They don't want to say no because you hurt people, mm -hmm. right? But actually what winds up turning is actually hurt them more by uh, not saying no. Because right. what happens is if you put yourself in, in our entrepreneur's shoes and what he really wants is, listen, I, want, I need to focus on my business, right? We want our founders to focus on only two things, which is 
again, the translation platform. You're either building product or you're selling it. Right. And everything else, you know, you may be outsourced or you have somebody else do it. Fundraising is always a pain, right? Uh, even the guys who are raising, like, you know, Swiggy and Zomato and our own Grey Orange fantastic story. Now it's great, but it's always a pain, you know, they tell you. Um, so, so fundraising takes so much time. So if somebody doesn't say no, uh, you, you wind up spending a lot of time and actually they may not have an intent of investing or they may not be ready to invest, but they don't say no. And uh, it, it sort of comes, it does come from, as you hit the nail on the head, from the culture of being, being nice and helpful and non-offensive, but actually what's being lost is that you'd rather say, hey, this doesn't feel a sweet spot. Why don't you meet three other VCs who do? Or we do, we are, this is too small for a check size, but come back to us in six months with traction, built out team, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, B two B strategy. So, but you hit the nail on the head. You're right. Uh, I, I think it's not just about being nice, but about being truthful and helpful. Right. But that's a hundred. You know, that's in, in general life, especially when it comes to this business. If someone strings someone along the long haul, and not, absolutely nothing's going to come out of it, um, it's just yeah. part of the process that you know, and no is quicker than much better. Yeah. That's right. So, so from like you're looking from the other perspective, you know, what are the common denominators you see between successful founders um, if someone wanted to implement it? Now, let, let's rephrase it. Everyone's journey is, is different, you know, and it's not something you could, and it's not if you copy someone's playbook to the T, not necessarily that you're going to end up successful too. But yeah. what, are, what are the certain characteristics that you see that a new founder or someone that is a founder already should implement in order to make a successful company and become a successful person themselves and a company? You know, I, I think you, you, you know, this is a $1 million question or a billion dollar question that, uh, that is the most important question that you got to the heart of that. And I think we, that we've become better at it, but we've not found the secret sauce. Mm -hmm. But I think if you think about the key ingredients, I would say, you know, all the best entrepreneurs start with a single minded ambition and passion and a very independent vision. They really don't care what, you know, about rejection, right? So for example, you make 10 pitches and nine people uh, say no. So I think that ambition and the uh, vision has to be there as a, as a given. Um, I think the second part would be um, the ability to carry, carry others along with you, right? So, you know, we thought about this a lot. There should be back single founders. And this is interesting, right? In any founding team, there's always a main founder. I, you know, that, that's always going to be the case. You're going to have Travis at Uber. Uh, you're going to have Brian at Airbnb. In some cases, they may be quote unquote democratic, but usually there's, there's a main founder, which is fine. But even then, do they have an understanding that they bring other people with them because you need a sounding board. So we've actually seen some fantastic single founders, but they just can't carry a team, right? They can't, the others, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're just super smart, but they just don't want to work for them. So I think that's usually important, not just to have a co-founding team, but also to build that chasm between you know your engineers, the troops in the ground, and the founders of the that second level is the most difficult thing. And I actually want to write a blog about this. I don't think it is, I think the second quality is not, it's not the ability of a founder to hire the team under them, just the level, but it's the willingness or the unwillingness. Right. It's in the mind, right? It's not the ability, anybody can do it. If you've got tons of capital and you've got a great brand, you can do it. It's whether they want to do it or not, right? That's the second. And I think, uh, I, w I would say the third is, uh, I think self-awareness, tremendous self-awareness of what, if you do a SWOT analysis of yourself and the team, uh, what you're good at, that applies even to somebody at like Zoom, right? I mean, we put out a team, uh, what is somebody really good at and what they're not and can they fill it? So I think the second and third are to do with the team. Um, and I would say, I would just say, you know, ruthless execution. I think we've seen, you talked about being nice, right? I think we've seen, you know, I, I think you, you, you know, this is a $1 million question or a billion dollar question that, uh, that is the most important question that right? you got to the heart of that. And I think we, that we've become better at it, but we've not found the secret sauce. Mm. But I think if you think about the key ingredients, I would say, you know, all the best entrepreneurs start with a single minded ambition and passion and a very independent vision. They really don't care what, you know, about rejection, right? So for example, you make 10 pitches and nine people, uh, say no. So I think that ambition and the uh, vision has to be there as a, as a given. Um, I think the second part would be um, the ability to carry carry others along with you, right? So, you know, we thought about this a lot. There should be back single founders. And this is interesting, right? In any founding team, there's always a main founder. 
I, you know, that, that's always going to be the case. You're going to have Travis at Uber. Uh, you're going to have Brian at Airbnb. In some cases, they may be quote unquote democratic, but usually there's, there's a main part of which is fine. But even then, do they have an understanding that they bring other people with them because you need a sounding board. So we've actually seen some fantastic single founders, but they just can't carry a team, right? They can't, the others, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're just super smart, but they just don't want to work for them. So I think that's usually important, not just to have a co-founding team, but also to build that chasm between, you know, your engineers, the troops in the ground, and the founders of the second level is the most difficult thing. And I actually want to write a blog about this. I don't think it is, I think the second quality is not, it's not the ability of a founder to hire the team under them, just the level, but it's the willingness or the unwillingness. Right. It's in the mind, right? It's not the ability. Anybody can do it. If you've got tons of capital and you've got a great brand, you can do it. It's whether they want to do it or not, right? That's the second. And I think, uh, I, w I would say the third is, uh, I think self-awareness. Tremendous self-awareness of what, if you do a SWOT analysis of yourself and the team, uh, what you're good at, that applies even to somebody at like Zoom, right? I mean, have you put out a team? Uh, what is somebody really good at and what they're not and can they fill it? So I think the second and third are to do with the team. Um, and I would say, I would just say, you know, ruthless execution. I think we've seen, you talked about being nice, right? I think we've seen, found, you, you can be nice. I think our philosophy and my philosophy is that you can be a nice founder and be helpful to others, but that doesn't mean you're, you're soft when it comes to execution, right? You're ruthless and you want to win. You want a, I would say, an unfair but legal advantage. It has to be legal, it's not illegal. But, but it's unfair and you want to win, but you can still be nice and helpful to others. Your juniors who approach you for help, you, and, and you have to give back, right? So I would say ambition with the ability to build a team. And then, of course, I think domain expertise and all that comes across. So we see that a lot. Yeah, 100%. So like, it's totally true. Let me ask you like this. If a first-time you know, first founder you know, comes with that amazing team, you know, to bloom for an investment or, the, but the product or the market is not there, or let's say the market is there and the founding team is not the best team. How do you evaluate that? I mean, what is it that you specifically, you know, um, you look for in the sense when a new founder comes to approach you? Sure. I think, you know, a large market size is the most important, but then you could take 10 teams and they go up to the, the single biggest market. I think one of the things we hear about is, um, you know, that investors, like we invest in a line and not in a point. So I think one thing we want to actually track, in fact, we're doing that from fund three is, I think we're investing a little bit more scrutiny with investing at a measured pace. We will still, we're still early stage and we still want to move fast. But one of the things we're seeing is that how has that founder evolved over time, right? Let's say we met them three months ago. When we meet three months from now, has he met with a different team member? Has he, has the business evolved? Uh, you know, is there more traction? Is he more self-aware? Has he grown? Three months may be short. That's that's one. Um, and I I, I, uh, I I think the other uh, the uh, the other aspect is also to, um, uh, to actually get the product out and just see how they're iterating, right? So for example, you know when we went back to the valley, we saw very often we, the, the VCs there don't want to look at decks, right? They want to see the product. I think that's what we want to see: how real is the product and the traction, not just you know we want to go beyond decks. Right. So I would, I'd say that uh, obviously market size is important to start with and the team is important, but we actually want to see on how the founders evolve over time. And I think also how, you know, it's interesting if you think about the fund business, it, it is a long-term business, but the real long-term founders, if you look at Samay and Akash, now Samay is 31 and Akash is 27. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, we backed them in 2012. That's one of our first checks, right? Uh, Karthik and I. And we joke, we say, Akash, if you're 27 now, how old were you when you back you? <laughs> you know, you're a teenager, right? Now, the interesting thing is the founders like that, they want to build for 20 years. Mm -hmm. If you look at Gaurav Manjwal of an academy, right, uh, from a fund too, which, uh, you know, he's building India's largest uh, learning platform. They don't want to build for 5, 10 years. They want to build for 20 years. So one of the things is also how long-term are these guys thinking, right? Is the founder thinking. It's not just market size, but how long does he want to build? Right. And we are actually sort of uh, impaired in that sense. The fund structure cycle is impaired because you are a 8 plus 1 plus 1 or a 10 plus 1 plus 1 fund. We would love to be one day is to get long-term backers for us as founders so that we can back founders long-term if you have perpetual capital, right? Because then you're not limited by your exit. I mean, we would love to find founders who want to build business for 20 years um, and, uh, and do that. So I think that long-term vision 
and what they're really in it for the long term, digging deep, not just to get rich quick, is really important. Essentially, Bloom is all about relationships with founders, long-term relationships with founders. That's phenomenal. But you touched upon one point right now that I'm just going to rephrase it a little bit in the sense that, you know, what is an entrepreneur in essence? Someone that wants to start a company, if they have the extrinsic or arterial motives besides, you know, a mission or purposeful meaning is just for making money, then it will never work out. They'll never be successful. I mean, you do have cases, but barely. You know, but if someone comes, you know, like you said, long-term vision, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, has a passion to change something, you know, and either it's because there's something wrong in their life, they want to fix it or something, or in general, they see there's a better way to do things. These are the yeah. entrepreneurs that become eventually become, and they, if they stick it out long enough and they, they don't get, you know, um, bored or they don't get caught in the, sure, yeah, yes. caught in the yeah. tide, these entrepreneurs eventually are the ones that they, they make it. They're the ones that yeah. are successful in everything, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I think you had, you know, I was uh, uh, sometime back, this guy called Michael Marx, he's the, the chairman and CEO of Flextronics. And he had come to India, uh, you know, he's an angel investor board member, we see. And uh, he was asked for the de definition of an entrepreneur. Right? So he says, how do you define an entrepreneur? He says, um, I, uh, you know, this is a small close door gathering. And he said, he said, an entrepreneur is somebody who believes in something that no one else believes in and then can go and convince others to join him in that path. Right. So I think both those parts are interesting because the first part is interesting, but, but you know, you've got to, you've got to inspire others to join that. And you also have to see something that others don't. I'll give you another very interesting quote. You know, Tim Draper is a very interesting person. I don't know if you spent time with him. But I'll give a bit of shout out to him. Um, it was very interesting. We're part of the Draper Venture Network, and uh, Tim is this fantastic guy. He's always in a suit and tie, but he's very, very startup friendly, entrepreneur friendly. And uh, you know, we were, uh, we were we were we were at the GP summit once, and the presentation suddenly stopped, and there was this you know picture of a surfer, uh, uh, a surfer surfing a wave, and he said, you know, think of yourself as uh, a GPs as founders, right? You guys are founders. You have your own firms that you started, like our me. And he said. When I look at most VCs, I look at the bell curve, all of the VCs think that they're ahead of that wave that the surfer is on, but they're actually all on the same wave. Right. <laughs> right? Because you're backing, as long as you back the same kind of people and, you know, who went to the same undergrads, colleges or the right schools, he said, how are you going to get different results in that sense? So he said, sometimes you've got to back those teams that are a little crazy. One of the guys looks a little crazy, he's got a lazy eye or crazy eye. Or uh, the guy who is just ahead of the wave or behind the wave and the others crash, you, know, you can pick up on that, right? He says, you've got to back those outliers. And if you look at a gray orange, it was a very interesting pick that no other Indian VC came in. Uh, after us, Tiger Global, we are the only institutional investors. Now they've raised money from people here. Also because when you're early, you can take that chance. You know, you can, you can, uh, you have a bit of the art also uh, beside the sun. So of course, you're a very scientific investor, but you can also think a little differently uh, and not just look through the lens of a balance sheet uh, sort of model, right? Uh, and I think that's the exciting part of early stage that you, you kind of can look for these founders and we always, we want to pick independently, right? We, we, I think the founders have come to know. Um, we've got to build a great community, but they're also slightly different. They're, they're not the run of the Right. Wow. That's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. You know, one thing for especially is that Bloom is very founder friendly. Um, you know, you guys have been called. I've seen it. You know, I've spoken to almost close to 100 entrepreneurs in India already, you know, uh, through interviews or not. And everybody somehow is directly, indirectly connected to Bloom through a company that you guys invested in or a company you dealt with or someone that spoke to you. And yeah. I have yet to hear a negative thing about Bloom in the sense that very founder friendly, um, you know, I one of the pe only, I guess, funds that really believe in, you know, pre-series A seed money and believe in the entrepreneurs when they just have the idea, uh, you know, idea phase. And it's phenomenal to see. And right. sure. And we see this right now, you know, for example, you know, one of your earliest checks you gave out was to a company called Metal. And I actually had the opportunity to interview um, Kitan. We actually interviewed him yeah. two weeks back. Um, and I had no clue back then, you know, that this is going to happen. So what is the feeling right now that one of your first um, investments was successful? It had a, a, you know, a proper acquisition, everything. 
Um, okay. well, it's very, very interesting. I'll tell you another uh, related uh, 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 fact uh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, the founder of Inmobi, uh, Naveen Tiwari, right, which we're close to because started in the angel, still angel investors in that. Um, uh, Ketan is, is Naveen's brother-in-law. Right? Yeah. What is interesting is when Naveen made the intro to us seven, eight years ago, because he was so confident of this team, he didn't even disclose that to us. Okay. And that is the most interesting part when you actually want the company to be treated and uh, viewed on its own merit, right? So this was one of the first checks that we got. And I think it's very interesting, you know, when you supported the company along the way, they've had their ups and downs, they were in the US and they came back, they pivoted, both Kartik and I worked closely equally with this company. Uh, it's, it's very... Uh, Think about Twitter, right? You know, here's the interesting thing about Twitter, right? You work, you're working behind the scenes, and then suddenly, with a milestone and event, you see this outpour in one Twitter. Right. I think, you know, I, I, when I reflect on that, I think what people don't realize is that everything that goes into that, right? So they say, like, it takes eight years of hard work to make to be an overnight success. But I think it stands out more. It stands out more because it, there has been a bit of criticism and feedback from India that the exits haven't happened, right? Uh, when Kartik and I get on the road and you know we're 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 talking uh, to LPs, I think one of the things is relative to China, those exits haven't happened as much or relative to the Valley. Uh, we had, uh, of course, Metal uh, now to Mercer. We had uh, um, uh, Bot Metric, Minja to Nutanix, and of course earlier Taxi to Ola. So I think it's fantastic for the ecosystem also. So I think emotions are on many different levels. I think in the ecosystem, we feel proud that, you know, we've been part of that. Obviously for metal, we feel very proud because, I mean, these guys were much younger when they came to us. Uh, you know, we met in the lobby of a hotel uh, with a very interesting idea then because I think then skilling and assessments hadn't really taken off. And now if you look at it, that's the biggest, I mean, that's the biggest driver, right? You're hiring somebody for uh, attitude more than aptitude. So I think it's a great feeling. Um, and uh, we'd love to see many, many more of those. And of course, the founders happy, and they've built a, they've built a team. Um, they, you know, when you go back to what good founders are, you know, they were able to recruit a senior enterprise head of sales from one of the large uh, uh, tech companies, and that made a big difference, right? They were self-aware and they said, okay, you know, we're going to be founders, we're going to do the first sales, but we need to uh, institutionalize this uh, team and hire professionals, and they were able to do that. So, of course, we feel fantastic and. And, and so does the whole uh, Indian ecosystem. Right. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And, you know, the amount, like you said, the amount of outpouring that you see from everywhere, everywhere, and the amount of articles, you know, your story came out a great thing of saying how this is incredible for the Indian startup ecosystem and everything. Um, but why is that, that you don't have too many um, acquisitions or exits within the Indian startup ecosystem? You know, I think one of the, uh, uh, one of the points is that uh, I think in India, Again, culturally, the tendency is, you know, because traditionally labor has been a little cheaper, this applies less to the tech world, but there's this, there's this been this ability that, you know, talent is our biggest spread and uh, let's throw people at the problem right. and uh, build versus buy, right? So, uh, you know, this is pretty interesting, the psychometric assessment of this cloud company. Uh, we've got 1,000 engineers, why can't we do it, right? I think that uh, respect for whether you call it IP or uh, something that's already been built hasn't traditionally been there. Now it's changing a lot. You see uh, lots of family offices getting set up within these large tech conglomerates. Um, you see the Mahindras and the Tatas, right, and the Infosys and the Wipros uh, becoming LPs and funds, investing on their own, uh, becoming direct investors and acquiring also. So you are seeing that, right? You're seeing this change. But traditionally, I think, I think culturally, like you talked about, it's like, you know, uh, the inability to say no uh, is... Uh, is the bill, the bill versus buy. I think a lot of it comes from that. Now I think people are saying that, hey, listen, that innovation is going to come from outside. Right. So we're seeing it in different ways. If you look at consulting firms, uh, I can't tell you the number of at least five, six consulting firms that have sought us out, want to think, view us as the bridge, right, between corporates and startups, and actually want to partner with us, organizing events, saying, hey, can you, uh, these are these are MNCs. These are Fortune 500 companies saying that hey, listen, we are organizing an event. Can you bring your 10 best startups to this? Uh, they're open. The Japanese are very open to this. Not very open. They're very interested in this. So it's changing. But but clearly, if you look at the value and you look at uh, you know, I, I, there's an interesting uh, uh, acronym. Everybody knows ROI, but uh, ROTI, ROTI. You know what ROTI is? Uh, is the bread, Indian bread, right? 
like the naan, you go to Indian restaurant, you eat roti and naan. Roti is return on time invested, right? So it's very interesting because again, coming back to the concept of time, start up saying, okay, I'm going to get the same, if you look at metal to muscle, uh, bot metric to Nutanix, both US companies, I'm going to say, listen, of course, I'm patriotic and I am very proud to create this company from India, like Naveed Tiwari when Mobi has always lived in Bangalore. He wants to create this unicorn from India. You know, he's never lived abroad after moving back from the US. So people say, hey, listen, if I'm getting the same value in about three, four years of the time and look at my roti, I'm going to maximize it, right? So I think I think uh, with these acquisitions that are happening, I think the Indian corporates are also looking up and they're hiring professionals to come and run their their ventures, which is again positive. Right. So it's basically size of change. Right. Wow. So then, so then, what are the differences you see to currently? Um, you know, in between, I guess the startup ecosystem in India and you know, in the rest of the world, like Silicon Valley, for example, or the US. Yeah. You know, I spent, I'd spent uh, ironically, very interestingly, even though I spent 15 years uh, in the US, of which 11 years were in Silicon Valley, I was never a full-time investor there. So a lot of people say, "Hey, listen, you know, Kartik and you were you investors that move back." Our sort of exposure started more from India, but I would say because we spent so much time in the valley now after we started Loom, uh, I think the uh, the concept of a serial entrepreneur wasn't here in India, right? So you didn't have people who had been there, done that, and most importantly is have you learned from their mistakes, right. uh, which is again the first time fund, right? The uh, uh, second time fund or the third time fund is like a serial entrepreneur, one would think. So you ask the question point blank, right? What are the mistakes? What are your learnings? And and even more sharper and a more interesting view of this is people want to say, okay, what were your learnings and what mistakes did you make on somebody else's dive? <laughs> you know, you didn't spend my money, right? So if you if you've learned if you made your mistakes on somebody else's dime, then great. I've not lost money and I've got a smarter entrepreneur. So I think the serial entrepreneurs are changing now. Uh, I think what is really interesting about India today, why Kartik, me and the whole team are excited is that the role model of India today is different. Uh, for the longest time, I think the role model were very respected Indians. In in some sense, like for me, I look at my father, right? I mean, now he's 70 and was Kartik also knows him. But look at Dr. Reddy's lab, who Kartik is closer to, Mr. Murthy, Mr. Premji, fantastic uh, uh, respected people. But what is a 20-year-old, how is he going to relate to them, right? Now, if you look at the role, new role models, the founders of Harvish Arola, Harsha at Swiggy, Dipinder at Zomato, of course, you know, Vinny at Flipkart, people are saying, hey, these, these guys are in the 30s. Um, uh, whether they went to the US or not, uh, they went there, they came back, uh, or they had startup experience. Uh, my background is pretty similar. Uh, they're doing it. I love, look at uh, Ritesh, uh, o, I mean, OU has done that at the age of 24, or rather doing that at the age of 24. I think I think that's very even Ketan and Tanmoy, right? They're now becoming role models today in a different sense because you have a lot of role models, but when somebody's seeing the full life cycle of an exit, people say, okay, they started a company, they grew it, they built it, they scaled it, and they exited it. We didn't have enough of those, right? We didn't have enough of the seed entrepreneurs. So I think that's a big that's been a big delta, a big difference between the Valley and India that hopefully should change. We still don't have the scale, like, you know, App Dynamics, you know, a billion dollar exit to a Cisco. Again, because the acquirers are like that. But I think that Delta will change. Uh, the other, I think the other difference is that uh, you have the concept of a professional CEO there, right? Like, I can't, you know, I remember I, so many times I'm sitting in Palo Alto in a, in a Cooper cafe and I'm talking to somebody and he says, you know, I'm running this company. And I say, oh, so when did you start it? He says, no, no, I didn't start this company. You know, I came in at the Series B. Mm -hmm. So this, again, comes back to self-awareness, I think, where you've had seasoned founders who say, I'm really good at, what I'm really good at is starting companies. That's what I like, but I, I can't run it. But then they don't mind bringing somebody else to run it. So I think that's, that's one thing. I'm not saying that necessarily that model works for India. Right. I think in India, I think you need role models and you need to look at the top and you need them to stay at the helm. So, uh, but there's some small differences. And then I think the scale is a difference, which we'd love to bridge. Uh, look at look at Flipkart, fantastic, right? I mean, the largest e-com e m and ever, uh, even one of the largest, right? Lar larger than a lot, lot of the uh, jet and everything uh, in the West. So it was, a, it was a global success story, not just the Indian success story. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing, uh, you know, thing. I'm gonna touch on one point you just mentioned. The fact that the new role models are you know the guys from Flipkart, Ola, Swiggy, Oyo, um, you know all these other phenomenal companies? 
you know, because as we know, India is a very risk adverse culture. You know, it's more about taking um, the safe route, you know, doing the safety, safety. And it's, that's obviously because, you know, where um, our parents came from, you know, India became a country in 1947 and then they were immigrants and they obviously had to work very hard until the government became, you know, more, I guess, um, people were able to ability to start their own companies. So, you know, it's a very risk averse and seeing now this new culture in the sense that who are the people that the youngsters are looking up to are the guys yeah. from Art, Oyo, Ola, Swiggy, you know, the guys from you guys and feeling in them an inspiration to go ahead and start and found a company is the, the most amazing thing. And, you know, it's just incredible. You know, it's incredible to see that happen, that whole revolution. Everything. You know, I mean, I mean, Indians are very business savvy, right? If you think about it, if you look at certain communities, Incredible uh, negotiators. Yeah. That, that's right. And we are, I think what's interesting is that you, you certainly have the advent of tech and then you've got this business minded, some communities which are very business minded. And then set, you combine that and that is a winning, lethal, deadly, very successful combination, right? So actually you're looking at, you mean the founders are coming in, actually have grown up in British, you asked about childhood. Uh, you look at the Agarwals, the Bansals, the Guptas, uh, they're all from a business community. Look at many of the founders of the e-commerce companies, almost all of them, all of them are from a business right. community. But then you marry tech, they want the IDs and, do, and that's a very interesting combination because you're, you're taking the business which is in your blood, quote unquote, and then adding a layer of tech and saying that, okay, this is how I can scale it, right? But I think the, 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 the new role models, I think are very interesting. I mean, I feel, I feel old in the sense when I see, you know, Okay, uh, you know, we're going to do a Forbes 30 on 30. Can, can you please nominate me for this 40? I said, when are you going to do a 50 on 50 and a 50? Uh, so uh, uh, it's fantastic. I mean, we're the youngest population in the world. I'll tell you a really interesting thing. I was talking to VC Homo back to Singapore. Singapore is a fantastic place. Everything works, right? It's just too perfect. And I asked him, what's it moving back? He says, my family loves it. It's so comfortable. He says, I just miss the buzz from Bangalore, right? He says, there's just a base for capital. There's nothing happening here. I just miss the energy and these guys, you guys are coming out at the age of 25, 26 and the, they, they're thinking about doing something very different today, right? And we look at our scale-ups, Fitbit for Cows, uh, uh, Unacademy, right? Learning platform. Uh, I think today, today's founders, the kind of problems they're solving are very different from five years ago. So the whole infrastructure has, uh, has been built. Right. Yeah, 100%. So then let me ask you, then what message do we, tw do we tell a 25 year old Sanjay, you know, that, uh, what message would you tell him? Yeah. You know, I'll tell you when I'm listening to most 25 years today, I'm listening more than telling them <laughs> because <laughs> they've, they've kind of been born in a very different India, right? Uh, you know, my son is now 15. Um, I'm, I'm very excited for him. I'm a global citizen. Um, I, your question was that if, what I would tell a younger Sanjay, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think one thing I would tell myself, you know, I was uh, kind of both about 37 when we started Bloom. I would say, uh, you know, I, I, in one sense, no regrets at all, but I wish I'd sort of quote unquote found myself a little earlier. Because when I look at some of these founders, I'm like, oh, you know, Akash, you're 27 now and you were like 22 when you started Rayon. It's amazing, right? I wasn't even half as mature. So I think one thing I would say, uh, we, 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 we grew up in a very, I grew up uh, uh, in a very linear way, right? You know, you, you went to school, you worked, you went to business school, you did this. You, I mean, in my case, or a lot of other people who got a green card, you became a citizenship, you became a citizen, and then you decided. It was linear. It wasn't dynamic and it wasn't a matrix structure. So I would say my advice to a younger self would be uh, think out of the box, think in parallel, and uh, uh, think non-linear, right? That's one. Right. Uh, right. The other thing I would say also was that, uh, uh, you know, surround yourself with really good people all the time because, uh, you know, this concept of a mentor is overused because, you know, people think that, you know, oh, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm mentoring, right? I'm mentoring a startup. But I think it's really interesting. I think if you look at our best boards and look at the best CEOs, uh, there's so much to be learned from that board meeting other than just business, right? It is about different views, seeing how the CEO is growing. Uh, uh, the richness between fellow board members, right, that come to be together in the context of context of a, a you know, I just tell you today we had a founder uh, in uh, uh, you know somewhere in Europe who called, who had a really good meeting, and uh, he he just picked up, he, you know, he gave me a WhatsApp video call and he said, 
uh, you know, I just called you because you had a really good meeting. We might get a term sheet. And then he said, the investor, who's a large fund, has really good things to say about you, about Bloom. And he asked me to call you. Uh, and I said, that's great. You know, I mean, th and this is in a different time zone. And um, I, think, uh, I think it comes back to surrounding around the right people. I think what we like in early stages, of course, we're here to create value to make money for our founders and for LPs. But if you're doing this with really smart people that you also like, uh, I think it's fantastic. So it comes back to the ecosystem. And the one thing I'll say, I'll see our, our CFO Ashish has an interesting comment. He says, founder friendly is good, but we, we, are, we are calling it founder first. Because founder friendly is, of course, you, have, you are founder friendly. We are founder friendly. But, uh, uh, you know, founder first, founder friendly. So it's, it's a different list of the same. Wow. You know what I want to know? I want to know who your mentors are. Just, just to think about the knowledge you have and the way how you are supporting the people around you and supporting your founders and supporting the people, you know, emotionally, um, you know, spiritually and intellectually, the way how you encourage them and support them. I want to know where you get your energy from. Who's, how do you, who are your mentor? You know, I, I mean, one, obviously one person that's close is, has been my father all the way, uh, you know, Mr. Dilip Nath, who's interesting. I think uh, uh, we've got a good set of advisors. Uh, I can't. I think it's just a group of good people. I can't really pin down, you know, one person. I think Tim. Tim is a very interesting. The way I look at mentors is that you're trying, you know, you're like a founder or any person should get something out of them. Not everything out of them, but every person contributes differently, right? I think Tim. I think as far as uh, you know, his his ability to sell a vision and to build a brand and to really go out and stake a claim. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think uh, what I learned from Mr. Nath, uh, my father, is just the ability to build a team and, uh, to, and to take risks at the age of 42, knowing nothing about software, to go out and start a software company with not two Indians, but two Americans, right? That was interesting. And uh, uh, I, I would say even, uh, I think the relationship with Karthik is fantastic. Um, with, with, you know, it's, it, you, you need a sounding board, right? I think the fact that we have each other and we built out the team is the biggest thing today. I mean, in different locations today, um, and uh, you know, you're growing together, you're learning together. Um, we've got some good mentors in the valley as well, some from Singapore. So, you know, no specific names that come to mind. I would say that uh, I wish I had more access to mentors when I was younger. But when, when I look at what founders have access today, I think they're very lucky. And I'm not praising ourselves or praising our other peers, but it's the ecosystem in India has matured and grown so much that the best founders have access to just a fantastic set of people, right? Which, uh, which, uh, which we did. Wow. And it's phenomenal. And you know, it's right. I mean, you know, the startup ecosystem is very big, but in the sense, the community is still very small in the sense that people are accessible over there a lot, you know, um, it's an incredible type of thing. So let me ask you, what books have made a difference in, um, in, in your life, you know, that you recommend to other people to read? You know, I, I wish I wish uh, I could read more, and I wish I, I do read more. Uh, my my son reads more than I do, <laughs> so um, I can't wait to see how your son grows up and what company he starts and what type of VC he's going to be. Well, he, he's big into design. Uh, you know, he spent uh, he spent uh, the summer at Columbia University. He did a program in art and architecture, and then he went into something at Stanford and IDEO. And I'm just letting him go because I think today parents should just let their kids find out. And design is very interesting, right? There was a recent study that talked about the talked about uh, some of the top internet uh, mobile internet companies, and uh, one founder of all those companies was actually a, uh, had a liberal arts background. It was not an engineer, right? Because it's thinking differently. You can't just have engineers running it. Uh, I, a couple of books, you know, I, I like, uh, I like, uh, I've read most of Musk's books. I like, uh, I like Zero to One. Uh, I very, very, very different thinking. Um, I, I like, uh, you know, I would say I'm a softer guy in the sense that I am a quant guy, but I like, I really like getting deeper into the personalities of people, including myself uh, and, you know, and others. And I think Stephen Covey's, uh, you know, all his books are very interesting. I've been reading about that. One of the most interesting books was, uh, you know, as business school, there was this uh, book called the DCII, which is the Business Career Inventory Index. It's a, it's a heavier book. It's not like a light book to read. But that went into pers beyond personalities like, uh, like Myers Briggs, ENTJ, and IPK, and really talked about we're all good at something, but what are interests? You know, we don't think enough about our interests. So you can be a really, really good lawyer, but what, what you know, is 
did you become a lawyer because your father did or because of something like that? And that was a very interesting book because uh, I actually sort of figured you know, who I was. I was very, very shy in, uh, in school. Uh, I became less shy in college and then when the US I became less shy. So today, you know, I, I, I lead and co-lead and do a lot of the ecosystem work for Bloom. And uh, when I looked at how shy I was in school, I can't do that. So experience has changed you. But I think that was one of the books that sort of also helped me examine who I am. Uh, I would love to read more. Uh, what we do is, uh, uh, this is Kartik's idea that we give all our founders a book for the body. Um, you know, one year Musk was a book. Uh, uh, one year Havels, uh, uh, fantastic story that Havels acquired a prompt tech renewables. And the proprietor, the, I mean, the patriarch of Havels has written this fantastic book. And we gave that book. So today, these just don't have to be value or invest books. We've got some fantastic stories from India itself. Right. You know, like I told Kartik, there's one book that I'm looking forward to. It's definitely the book from Bloom. You know, the Bloom book, whatever, how they did it, how you guys accomplished everything. I'm just really looking forward to that. I know it's going to be a phenomenal story to share. Incredible story to share. We will bring a... We'll, we'll, be, we'll be dying our hair and everything by then. So, <laughs> always in, always. You, you always stay young. You guys will stay young forever. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, Sanjay, you know, I could go on for hours talking together with you. I mean, the amount of knowledge you have, um, you're just an incredible person, you, Kartik, and everyone else, but it's just phenomenal. Um, you, guys, you guys are my mentors. You know, you and Kartik, there's so much to learn from you. And I, and I hope, you know, everyone over there in, in India and everyone that's associated with Bloom takes the fullest, fullest advantage of you guys. Like literally just, like, you know, takes advantage and, you know, in a positive sense, you know, trying to extract all the knowledge you guys have to offer because it's just tremendous. Um, sure. This has been absolutely phenomenal. You know, I have learned a tremendous amount. And, you know, this is just a scratch of the surface and we're definitely going to have to do a bunch, a bunch more in order to get more knowledge, get more insight. You know, you should start giving college courses, you and Kartik. You know, I know you guys are very pressed for time, but somehow you should fit in tighter to start giving courses, you know, in India. But literally, thank you. Thank you so, so much. You're, you're, very, you're very welcome. If I may pay you a compliment, I think one of the things is that you know, your, your energy and enthusiasm when you look at the founders, right? And you ask me what is really important to a founder. I think the energy and enthusiasm and optimism, a lot of people have optimism, but the energy and enthusiasm can only come from inside. Right. I think the energy and enthusiasm that you have on the call is very important for founders to have because it's, you have your darkest days, right? And uh, you, you get slammed in a customer meeting or an investor meeting or somebody doesn't like your pitch. The only thing that you have is yourself. And uh, we, we were recently looking at a founder, Karthik and I, and one of the team members, and they said, we love the idea, but we thought the founder had a little lower energy. Uh, and uh, uh, then, you know, I actually met the founder again in Bangalore and found that that was fine. Maybe he had a very early flight. But energy and enthusiasm is extremely important because uh, you can't be defined by your business model right. or, or, or the day you had or by the kind of investor, whether you had a good meeting or bad meeting, right? I think that energy and enthusiasm has to come. And that is inspiring to everybody around you. So, so I also wish you the best. And I think that is a very important quality of a founder. When they talk about inspiration of George, Steve Jobs, of course, he inspired people with products. But he also inspired them when he had nothing, right? Well, how, the, the, the trick is, how do you inspire somebody when you have nothing? Right. Not when you're a billion dollar company. Then people come to you for the greed and they're not coming to you for the inspiration, right? And I think that that I, I will pay that compliment back to you, which we like to see in our founders, is to have that energy and enthusiasm all the time. You have to have it can, it can dip up and down, but that has to be there. I would say that's the, the how do you like? I, I always like to think after a meeting, how do you feel after that meeting? Like, what is the tone of the meeting? You know, you you of course the content and the minutes are there, but how do you feel in the meeting with the high energy? You know, the good meetings is like a it's like a like good airline flying. You don't want that plane to land. You don't want that meeting to end. Those are the meetings. So uh, thank you. I really appreciate your doing this as well. It was a pleasure being on. Yeah, sure. Listen, send it, send the entrepreneurs my way. I'll educate them how to be full of energy and how to do it. You know. But thank uh, you. I, I appreciate all the comments on on Twitter. I think it's fantastic to get this outside India. Also, it knows. I think it's recognition that. The Indian ecosystem, uh, Indian VCs and uh, founders, and uh, everybody's being recognized and being seen outside India as well. That means a lot.
Yeah, it's a totally honest thing. And like, you know, it goes without saying, if there's anything I can do for you, um, for your family or for Bloom in general, always here for you guys. Uh, Thank so. you. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for doing this. And I'm, 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 I really appreciate the flexibility and I'm happy we could finally nail down the time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Thank you. Thank you.